Uh, thank you very much for coming. This is our uh, third annual uh, seminar of this type to touch on the issue of transnational organized crime. Uh, I've been involved in Latin American issues for about 30 years, uh, and people have asked me in that period, uh, what's the biggest uh, problem confronting uh, the region? I've had different answers over the, over the years, as all of us would. Uh, but now I think it's a very clear one, transnational organized crime, uh, partnering with uh, criminal states uh, that have uh, at their disposal vast resources, uh, ruthless allies, able to operate uh, criminal organizations seamlessly across the border with vast resources. Global transnational organized crime have, having about $2.2 trillion uh, at its disposal, basic, basically the GDP of Mexico, uh, and this manifests itself right up to the U.S. southwest border. The disintegration of institutions in, in various countries, uh, criminal states uh, operating uh, to uh, attack democratic institutions, literally attack security forces overwhelm the capacity of intelligence or, or, or armed forces or police uh, to deal with the threat uh, to basic institutions, uh, diminishing the civil security uh, and human rights conditions and, and the economic capacity uh, of countries because there isn't a viable state that is capable of uh, imposing the rules of the game in the economic uh, uh, ambient. In this case, uh, this morning, we are honored to have with us a practitioner, a very distinguished practitioner on the front lines uh, of this struggle uh, in, in the form of Raul Ernesto Malara Moran, uh, who was sworn in as Attorney General of El Salvador in December 2018. He has previously served as Deputy Magistrate of El Salvador Supreme Court from 2015 to 2017 and is Executive Director of the National Association of Private Enterprise, uh, some of you may know as ANEP, from 2004 to 2010. He has also been an advisor for the country's High Labor Council, Higher Labor Council and a consultant for the Ministry of Economy and the Superintendent of Electricity and Telecommunications. He received his PhD in law from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Welcome uh, very much, Attorney General Melana. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you thank very you. much for accepting our invitation. Oh, thank you. And, and for agreeing to make your presentation in English, uh, uh, which you're very capable in. Uh, it is, I know it's, it's uh, me in, in Spanish requires a lot of imagination on the part of the audience. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, 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 in this, and I find them rather indulgent. But uh, in this case, uh, we, we appreciate your you taking know, that task Thank you very on. much. I will try to do my best. I just hope you, your ear doesn't explode with my pronunciation, <laughs> but, but... No, no, I'm sure you do very very well. Just make sure you, you speak up. <laughs> okay. Speak up so everybody can okay, hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, and I want to, first off, uh, would you tell us about your office? Uh, tell well, us about the Attorney General's office, what its competencies are, uh, what the team is like, who you answer to, what's the term of office, that sort yeah. of thing. Well, uh, I'm the, as the Ambassador said, I'm the Attorney General of El Salvador. Uh, we call it Fiscalia General. Uh, the Fiscalia is the, has the duty to lead all the criminal investigations of all the crime that is committed uh, uh, in the country. The term is for three years. I'll be three years at the office. Uh, can, I can be reelected too. And uh, thankfully, I don't answer to anyone. I'm not appointed by the president. I'm appointed by the Congress. So there's a difficulty to be reelected because whether you touch one side or the other side, they almost doesn't are happy with what the attorney general does. But I think that's good. That's a sign that something is doing the right, the right way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our office. Do you, what, what uh, authority, what are your, what's your jurisdiction? Is it across the board, or just criminal investigations? Or? Well, we, we investigate uh, crime in the whole country. We don't, we don't have a federal jurisdiction. Uh, we're national, so we go all around the country uh, prosecuting all the criminals. Mm -hmm. 
Well, an interesting question for this panel, uh, for, this, for this audience. Uh, tell us a little bit about the, how you see the transnational organized crime challenge in El Salvador, and what are your priorities uh, as Attorney General? Yeah, well, that, that, that's a, a really complex question because, first of all, uh, I understand what crimes and organized crime do to entrepreneurs. I come from the private sector. And in El Salvador, we sadly have gangs. And they have, they have an organization that has just uh, not come territory local. But they have grown so much they ha that they have mingled with all the transnational uh, gang and transnational crime, and they are all the way from Central America and expanded from over the world. And that's a hard thing. I mean, the, and they are getting every time more sophisticated. They are uh, recruiting people. They're not just uh, the tattoo, guys that you see on TV or in the news, they're hiring lawyers, they're hiring professionals, they're hiring politicians, they're hiring entrepreneurs because they need to laundry all the money they are getting from extortions, that they are getting from all the violence that they are uh, carrying out through the country and other countries. So I have to say extortions, they hit hard on entrepreneurs. And this makes people to feel unsafe. This is, this is, this is one thing because uh, the, the people that works in a non-formal economy the people that works on the streets and markets, uh, small stores in the center of the towns, they live between gangs members. And they come along and ask for extortion every day. So they don't feel safe. So they have to, to agree of those extortions because if not, their lives may be in danger. So that, that, that's a hard thing. And one, one thing that, that, is, that is very sensitive, according to the uh, Peace Global Index of the World Economic Forum, violence cost in El Salvador is approximately $4 billion. $4 billion that could be, uh, that could destination would be health, education, uh, productivity, but we are getting all that money uh, to violence at all. And on the other side, we have an AG's office that has a very low budget. Uh, our budget is about $78 million. Mm -hmm. That only represents about 1.4, 1.5% of the national budget. So that's, that, that's hard. I mean, we don't have many financial resources, but we have to do what we can with what we got. And luckily, we have a lot of will. We have uh, the capacity. And, uh, but, I think that we have to work to have an AG's office that is financially independent, that doesn't have to go year after year to the central government, to the executive branch, to ask for money, because that gives independence to the authorities too. In the way that we have a budget to hire the best human resources, in the way that we have money to uh, have technology. The, in that way, uh, we can we can be a better a better uh, fiscalia. But 
we can't keep our arms crossed. We have to do some. And I, and I can tell you, in my nine months at office, we have initiated more corruption cases than in the last three years that had my two predecessors. All those cases, some more than $600 million that have been taken away from the organized crime and as I said, money that couldn't be invested in so many things, infrastructure, education, health, better services. So my goal is to live a better institution, better than I found it. Uh, and I think that the work is hard, but as I said, we have the will. We have to fight corruption in a, in a better way. And in the way that the people feel that the Fiscalia is doing their job, they're gonna, uh, in the way that they feel that the Fiscalia is protected them, I think that in that way we will have a more com competitive country. They would feel safer to be at home, not to go, not to make, migrate, to other mm -hmm. countries, and I, and I think that's what everybody wants. Every state, every government wants to keep their best assets, that is their people, at home. So I think that's one of the big challenges that, that we have. Excellent, that's a, a very good introduction uh, by all means. And for a lot of people here, I mean, we, cons we, we consider this issue of transnational organized crime at the 30,000 feet level. Uh, and in your case, it's you know, everyday reality. Yeah. Uh, thousands of gang members menacing uh, uh, the population, uh, you know, as you say, extorting uh, private sector folks, undermining the economy, even citizen security. It's a very real thing for you. Uh, and it impacts us in terms of, as you say, displacing people uh, and uh, feeling that they can't uh, survive or, or, uh, or even physically uh, in El Salvador and, and find their way uh, here to the United States. Certainly this is something we should, we should uh, uh, a goal we should share with you to, do, to ta tackle these issues. Tell us about the international partnerships that you have. Uh, what does the United States uh, government do with your uh, office, not just now but historically? Uh, and uh, for even, even Mexico uh, yeah. and other neighbors. Uh, your cooperation within Central America, give us a, an overview yeah. of that. Well, I think that, that the backup that the international uh, community is giving to El Salvador is good. Uh, specifically, uh, the relation that we have had with the United States for a long time, I think that cannot be better. Uh, we are great allies in the fight of corruption and transnational crime. I think they have been backing up with technology, they have been backing up with uh, getting more capacity to investigate crime. We have, we have met uh, with all the agencies of the US government and they are working with us to, to give us the knowledge to do a better work. So I think that's, that's great. Recently, I had the, the chance to, to meet with, with your AG, AG William Barr. Uh, we had a very good discussion and we had committed, not just El Salvador, but the countries of the North Triangle and Mexico, as I know, uh, to do better politics to avoid human traffic, for mm -hmm. example, to make better laws to fight transnational crime. And I think that the, that the will of, the, of Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, and also Mexico uh, is strong. And uh, AG Barr uh, went to El Salvador uh, around a May, I think, around May. And he was really impressed of what had been do, going on uh, with the 
with the, with the three countries, and mostly, I have to say, it, well, with, with El Salvador mm. efforts. Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think uh, the cooperation is essential for us. We, can, we cannot uh, be blind. We are a poor country. So we need all the help we can get. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, with, the, with the cooperation of countries as the US, uh, also the European Union, uh, Canada, uh, I think that we are making more improvement in the way that we investigate and fight crime. We, we also met with the Deputy Director David Bowditch of the FBI. Uh, we met with him. Uh, unfortunately, the Fiscalia doesn't have a group of investigators of their own. We have to work with the police. So we had a, a very interesting uh, talk with the Deputy Director Bowditch about how to integrate efforts and to fight international international crime too. Mm -hmm. So I think I think that that we need to find more ways to enhance this cooperation. And I have to say this cooperation needs to be in both ways. Cooperation cannot be just uh, extending the hand for receiving. We have to give. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, on this government, and of course, uh, my office, are willing to, to give back. I think in the way that we, we give back better laws, uh, that we give back more security to our people, we are going to be fulfilling all the, all the requisites that are asked for us uh, to receive with all the, all the resources that are given by some other countries. Mm -hmm. When we see a lot of the problems in, in, in the Americas, it's where the United States is kind of pulled back and not provided the kinds of economic engagement and, as well as political engagement. Uh, in Central America, you know, just 10 years ago, passing CAFTA, we had great expectations for this economy. But I think we stood back passively when transnational organized crime moved in very aggressively, uh, and particularly in the Northern Triangle countries, uh, uh, and we didn't do enough. Uh, and so we're kind of playing catch up, and, and, and we need strong national partners. And in El Salvador, we've had that. Uh, uh, in Guatemala, there's been, you know, sort of an international in, in involvement. Honduras, I, I'm not quite sure. I think the OAS has a role there, kind of bolstering these institutions. But it seems that the U.S. works very, particularly closely with El Salvador because there are, you know, frankly, some common criminals that, that you know, that, that are problems for U.S. national security that are operating there. The gangs that are vertically integrated into every American city ha have their roots there in El Salvador. So it's it's gratifying to see uh, the U.S. engaging in, in this way. It's interesting that you have to rely on the, the, the national police for your investigators. Do you have like vetted units that you work with uh, that yeah. you're able to share this information with? And also, has the U.S. provided any support for? Uh, lab, uh, you know, crime labs, that sort of thing that can be used. Yeah, by. yeah. Uh, police has some vetted units. Uh, we work very closely with a uh, with a group that that uh, is in charge of the wire center, the intervention center of of, of communications. Mm -hmm. So they are vetted. Also the. The staff of the fiscalia are vetted too. Um, yeah, we're having we're having uh, a lot of collaboration. Recently, the Howard Buffett Foundation gave uh, around 25, 30 million dollars to build the crime lab for the for the police. So, so that's good because we're we're gonna be the first customers of, of that lab and. and we are, we are glad and we, 
we appreciate that collaboration of the of not just the Howard Buffett Foundation, but uh, the U.S. government that have been involved uh, in giving us those resources to fight crime. I think that that's a great that's a great uh, thing that is going on. Excellent, excellent. So, uh, kind of a surprise, but very good news. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let's talk to the extent you can about your fight against corruption. Uh, you know, one, there's a particular target that we uh, address in one of our first reports on transnational organized crime, Jose Luis Merino, uh, and his network uh, in El Salvador that is actually a pretty broad regional network given his cooperation with the uh, narco regime in Venezuela. I know there's probably limits to what you could say, but there are some public actions that your office has taken. You, you can uh, sort of brief our audience yeah, on that. Yeah, well, uh, as you know, uh, the ALBA group uh, that was born in Venezuela as a kind of social movement or something like that, uh, they were related, closely related to the last government of, of El Salvador that was uh, with the left party FMLN. So the last day of the government was May 31st. The last day of the government uh, we as Fiscalia made them a, made them a little visit to uh, a few companies of them. I, I don't know how many there were. I think about there were like 30 or 40 companies. We, we raided those companies and we uh, just got all the evidence that we can of the money laundry that could have been done or any other operations that could be a name as transnational crime. So we are working on that. We, as you can imagine, proce to process all that information will take a, a while. Mm -hmm. Will take a while. Uh, we are having the collaboration of the United States in that uh, to give us uh, the capacity, resources to, to do that work in the, in the better way. Uh, and respecting the independence of the of the fiscalia, which is which is great. Uh, so, well, that that's a that's a big thing for us. But there is a sign that we needed to 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 send. I mean, you cannot uh, take advantage of a government. You cannot take advantage of a country that is needed to make illegal money. I mean, no matter who does that, uh, I don't care if it's a right party or, or it's a left party. The thing is that you cannot take the money from the people. The, I, I don't care really uh, if the money uh, isn't from people of El Salvador, but it's from people from Venezuela that pay their taxes that we're working, they are not getting an easy life right now. So if there's something we can do from our countries to, to make it right, we will make it right. Mm -hmm. well, so what was happening was, as, as I think most people here understand, is this ALBA network that Chavez created uh, very much with, in collaboration with Merino at the, at the very, you know, laying the foundation of this was to supposedly push money in for social programs. Yeah. Uh, and instead, it became a money laundering uh, machine. Those are my words. Uh, essentially, uh, for criminal, organi criminal organizations to use, narcos, and to launder looted money that was... Yeah, the, 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 it, it began to, to create a, a lot of companies. So we, we need to know where the money came to create all those companies, all those millions... Uh, that were uh, going on in transactions. We, we, we estimate we estimate that from 2010 until 2019, they have had operations uh, of more than three billion dollars, mm -hmm. just from El Salvador, mm -hmm. just from El Salvador. So we need to know what what had been going on with all that money. Mm -hmm. Where did it come from? Where did it go? 
what was done with that mm -hmm. money. So, And Merino has historic links to the FARC. Are you finding any patterns in your investigation that lead back to that kind of cocaine trafficking or well, the, the FARC? I, I can't tell okay, you about good. that. Okay, good. All right, that's fine. <laughs> that's, that's fine. So let's, but, I, but I know that you had to ask. <laughs> yeah. Let's talk about other things that are going on uh, with the corruption, on yeah. the corruption side, and things that are in the newspapers. Uh, you've, uh, your office and your predecessor have dealt with former presidents. Yeah. How are things going in, those, in that regard? Yeah, uh, we're processing two former presidents. President Elias Antonio Saca and President Funes. Uh, President Saca is already serving time in jail. He's been convicted to 12 years in prison. Uh, not much for me, but it is what it is. But that's the first example of a president in jail in El Salvador, and, that's, and I think that's great news. And I have to say, it, my predecessor had a, a strong will to prosecute uh, those presidents uh, all the way. So I think, and, and with the help and uh, with the support of the U.S. government, I, I have to recognize the work that the former ambassador, Jean Maines, did in El Salvador in the fighting against corruption. I think she, she, she helped uh, the Fiscalia in a great way. And, I, and I am, I'm sure that with the new relation that we are building with uh, Ambassador Johnson, we will do better things. Uh, and I hope we can extradite President Funes that now is a Nicaraguan citizen and we have a little difficult to, to, to send him back to El Salvador for that. But he is, he's being indicted for crimes uh, that involve around uh, $250 million that went from one place to another during his term. Uh, President Saka was convicted for $260 million. Uh, I'm going to correct. I think Funes was $300 million. Mm -hmm. And that, that might not seem a lot in some countries, but for us is a huge amount of money. And at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if there are 300 million or 1 billion or whatever is that they're taking the money that is not from them, that they're taking, taking advantage of the government. Mm -hmm. um, it cannot happen anymore. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Saka is an interesting uh, case. I mean, last time I was in El Salvador, well, one of the, as, a, as an official, I was seating, seated to his left at a dinner with Condoleezza Rice, and Tony Saka was considered a, 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 an ally of the United States. Yeah. Uh, and we discovered later uh, the reason behind him splitting Arena and, and undermining uh, the governability of the country was essentially, uh, apparently, uh, because he was being paid uh, and, 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 uh, by criminals uh, to, divide the, uh, to, to divide the party, to... Uh, commit this kind of systemic cor corruption. Uh, and so, you know, I, I think it's good news that you're going after those folks. You know, the rule of law, a lot of people can't really relate to, relate to it. I think across the globe, people understand what the rule of law meant when the U.S. attorney in Brooklyn started indicting FIFA people, because everybody, could under, everybody in the world can understand FIFA, right? Yeah. They understand, and they all knew, everybody in the world knew it was crooked. And then these sons of guns from the U.S. Justice Department goes, and I, I remember talking to Loretta Lynch about this, uh, that, you know, the, the, sim, the, the message that's sent, uh, that the, the rule of law is for everybody. Yeah. And in, for, in Central America, uh, I, a friend of mine uh, once commented that the, uh, that, the, that the judicial system is like a rattlesnake. It only hurts the people who, are, who, don't, who don't wear boots. 
uh, who aren't, you know, who are the shoeless ones, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's important that, you know, that people in El Salvador and other countries see that the judicial, judicial system can go after those big guys. And, and like you say, these are people that are robbing from their own people and, and denying them uh, the resources they need to improve their lives and doing the things that governments uh, have to do. Uh, so th th that's extraordinarily important. Um, let's talk about what you're seeing in terms of the footprint of the FARC or of the, of the, or the Venezuelan uh, criminal regime in El Salvador. What, 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 what are you seeing as a, as a, uh, a law enforcement official? Well, I can I can talk a bit a little of that, but um, the, the things that the, the the Alba Group is assigned, I don't know it from the FARC, but uh, it's it's public. That is money that came from Venezuela to El Salvador to do uh, social things, and it resulted in the creation of a lot of. And new entrepreneurs and a lot of companies that were growing up and up and making millions of dollars. So we have to do we have to do a, a, a straight investigation. We have to do uh, we have to act very independent and with a lot of objectivity to to know what what what's going on mm -hmm. to know what's going on. But the thing is that, like you said, I mean. You have to send a message that the rule of law is for everybody. Mm -hmm. No one is above the law. Mm -hmm. Not even if you are on the government, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are a politician, whoever you are, uh, you have to, to comply the law. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an expression in Spanish, plata o plomo, uh, silver or lead, uh, where they offer you uh, the bribes, not you, uh, uh, but uh, ever, uh, like, a, you know, first person who used that expression with me was the former mayor of Chihuahua, I think, uh, who was saying that they, they threaten my, they, they, they offer my police chief 10 times what he's paid for the government, or they will say, here are pictures of where your, your, your kid's going to school. And it's a very real threat. And that's the kind of threat that, that people in your line of, work or, or, or confront every day. Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's, a very, that's a very Mexican and Colombia uh, phrase, mm -hmm. plato plomo. Uh, but- Salvador doesn't. No, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that they just offer the, the money. <laughs> uh, I think bribery is, is a thing that is everywhere. I mean, but we have to, that that's one of the things that we have to 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 take care of to have better public servers. I mean, I think that to have an honest guy is better to have a brilliant guy. Mm -hmm. uh, but we we are trying to to put those those values on each public server at the fiscalia. Uh, when you are honest, when you do your job the right way, uh, you have a more impact in people. I mean, you give them you give them a better quality of lives. Uh, why why does people? I mean, why is America so strong? I think not. Obviously, the entrepreneurs. But why the entrepreneurs are so strong? Because they rely on the system. They rely on the rule of law. And that's what we're trying to do in El Salvador too. We are working together. We are working very strong with the judicial branch. Uh, and we are trying to make a good work, a great uh, work in El Salvador to put away all those not so good public servers and to bring uh, to the government uh, and to the public service uh, good, good people. And I, and I think that takes time, that takes time. But uh, I think that the Supreme Court 
the Fiscalia and there are other institutions that are trying to do the work the best way they can. I'm going to take this, take some questions here. We have a microphone. Thank you very much for the comment, yeah, sure. by the way. We have a microphone in the back of the room that this gentleman will hand to you and invite you, this lady in the front here, right here, to uh, just introduce yourself and uh, ask an actual question. Absolutely. Uh, my name is Adeline Haidt. I work with WOLA, the Washington Office on Latin America. Thank you both so much for speaking about these important issues. I just wanted to ask a little bit about your opinion on this potential commission to uh, international commission, CCS, in the country, how you might see it uh, working effectively, or, or what are your thoughts about how uh, to bolster capacity uh, from an international standpoint? Uh, I had one other quick question. Um, I wanted to ask, in August, the uh, government of El Salvador officially recognized uh, 116 cases of extrajudicial killing from the police. Um, how do you see those investigations moving forward? Um, and again, thank you for being here and sharing. Thank you, Aaron. Excellent questions. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, well, the CCS is a, it's a project that has been going on. Uh, that's an international mission that their their goal is to to make cases to fight corruption to avoid impunity and and i think that's that that's okay i mean i i we have two examples in the region one is guatemala that had the cc cc was led by the un and the other model that we have in the region is Honduras with the MAXI that is led by the OAS. Um, right now in El Salvador, uh, both organizations have gotten into conversation with the executive branch to, uh, to build a CCS. Uh, I think the OAS uh, is moving faster, is moving faster in that way. I have spoken to both, also the UN and the OAS, and I've said to them that I, I will accept all the collaboration that, that we can get. I will take it. Uh, but there has to be some requirements that have to be fulfilled. The first, Thing, and I know that, that they agree with that, is that they know that the Fiscalia is the, is the one that has to lead all the investigations. Not because I want to, but because the Constitution requires that. So there's no one uh, that, can make, that can make cases than the Fiscalia. Uh, that's number one. And number two is that uh, all, the, all the capacities need to be given to the Fiscalia. I mean, all these international missions go, they do their job, and they have to go back. But they don't have to leave weak institutions. They have to leave strong institutions. Um, in the way that they just get stronger themselves, they are not giving any benefit to the country. And at the end of the day, we are, as Salvadorians are the ones to have to live with our institutions. And we have, we have and we need stronger institutions. So, so as I said, I will take all the collaboration that, that, I, that I can get. No one can be against the fight of corruption. In the way that uh, more people join us and give us the resources, uh, that, would be, that would be great. But, but they have to, to respect what the Constitution says about the, the capacities of the Fiscalia. And, and the, the other, second question the other, was the one, 116 extrajudicial killings. The extrajudicial executions, yes. Uh, we, as a matter of fact, we, 
we made an operation and we uh, detained around 14 or 15 policemen about a few weeks ago that were involved in extrajudicial executions. Uh, that's a sign that we are working on it. We are taking that very seriously. We can let our police uh, uh, do that. Uh, the thing goes that, again, we need resources. We need resources to have more, more uh, attorneys. We need resources to enhance our capacities. But we are doing whatever we can to, to put them away. Other questions? Let's see. Uh, why don't we stay right here in the front, and then I'll come over to the gentleman and then the lady. Thank you. Hi. Uh, my name is Anastasia. I'm a, a master's student at Johns Hopkins SICE, concentrating in Latin American studies. And I was wondering, so the, the question of resources has come up a lot. And I'm just wondering if you can give us a very short framework of what you see the most effective use of resources would be to fight organized crime, considering they're limited. So in order of priority, is it you know, military and police spending? Is it uh, resources being used to reform the law? Is it actually investment in infrastructure and social programs? And specifically, you've talked a lot about how legal reform is important. And I wonder, in the current framework of things, how much of a difference do you think legal reform can make uh, considering, again, the infrastructure, the education system, the opportunities for other econ ways to make money, other economic ways to survive within uh, El Salvador specifically, but also the Northern Triangle. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I, I think, but I, I think that, that uh, legal reforms are, are okay. Uh, but I, I, I didn't mean that legal reforms were the... Uh, I don't think that legal reforms are the number one thing that we have to change for that. I think that what we have to do is to enforce the law. Uh, if you don't have the will to enforce the law, nothing's going to change. So what, what we really need is to enhance our capacities, technologically speaking, because organize, organized crime uh, is, going, is always going ahead of us. And that's something that we have to, to correct. Uh, in the way that we have more resources, more attorneys, more investigators, more capacitations, that's how training. you say it? Yeah, more training, more training. I think that we're gonna be uh, making a, a better work. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gentleman right here. Hi, Jacob Rich from Reason Foundation. Much of the world demand for illegal narcotics is from the United States. And I'm just curious what your opinion on drug legalization in the United States would have on cartels. What would happen to their economy if that happened and whether it's a reasonable idea? Well. I, I, I cannot say if, if it's reasonable here in the States, but I, uh, if it's going to have an impact, yeah, I think it might have an impact if the drug is legalized in, in the U.S. Uh, they will want to become legal entrepreneurs, so uh, definitely it will have an impact. If it's positive, I don't know. My, my honest uh, answer is that I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go with this gentleman, and then I'll come back over here to this side. Since he's the mic right there, why don't you go ahead? Hi, my name is Joseph Carl. I'm an intern at Heritage Foundation and Allison Center for Latin America. Uh, I was wondering, do you think that Bukele's security plan, the territorial, territorial control plan, is an effective is effective in the long term in decreasing crime and violence in El Salvador? Or do you think there's a better way of going about it? Well, one thing that, that I have to say is homicides have reduced in, the, in, this, in this presidency term, in these four months. We have been 
from 10, 12 deaths uh, a day. And now they have reduced about five, six, seven. Uh, so if you want an honest uh, question, uh, there is there is has been a, a a reflect of the plan because the plan came immediately. He he got into office, and they have reduced uh, homicides, and, th and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. I hope that it can be sustainable in time. Uh, but I think four months is is still uh, a too sh too short time. Mm -hmm. To, to say if it's going to be sustainable, because I think that the territorial plan has several uh, several steps mm -hmm. can be, and I think that they are not developing they are not developing yet uh, step two of the of the of the plan. The plan, uh, as far as as far as I know, involves prevention, uh, involves another things more than than repression. So. Mm -hmm. So at this time, I can say it has been positive. Excellent. Well, and I, I have the lady here uh, in the black sweater and then the lady behind her, but the other lady closer to me. Yes, please. And then we'll go to the other one, and then we'll, that, that'll be it for the question. Thank you, please. Uh, Mary Speck, uh, I'm with the newly formed commission, the Western Hemisphere Drug Policy okay. Commission. It's a bipartisan uh, commission with funding from Congress uh, to study uh, issues, uh, counter-narcotics policy very broadly, including issues such as citizen security. Uh, and you mentioned that um, Cecilia's needs to leave El Salvador, to be effective, Cecilia's really needs to leave El Salvador. Uh, institutions stronger. And I wondered if you could assess current efforts, particularly those involving U.S. aid and, and other foreign donors, to strengthen the institutions of justice in El Salvador, and what you feel are the most urgent needs at this point um, to leave El Salvador uh, with stronger rule of law. Thank you. I think that, that we, what we need, well, look, first of all, Look at what we have done without the CCS. We have prosecuted not just gang members, we have prosecuted politicians, we have prosecuted former presidents. We are going at transnational crime. And what that shows is that we are capable and that we have the will of doing that. But we lack of technology, we lack of training, and we need that support. In the way that the, the, the Fiscalia gets stronger in both ways, we're going to be able to do more. I mean, sometimes, uh, People wonder why cases take so long. And it is not because we don't want to investigate. Well, it's also because investigation takes time. But we don't have all the people that we need. We don't have all the, train, all the training that we need. And in the way that we have more training people, more financial analysts, more forensics, more professionals in, in those matters, in the way that we have technology that helps us, uh, in that way, we're gonna have a strong institution. If she can get you some more resources, this is your new best friend. Yeah. And actually there are people here, all over here, who can be very helpful to you. Yeah, so I know, thank you. Make sure you give your business cards. <laughs> and the lady there. Hi, Carmen Rodriguez for La Prensa Gráfica from El Salvador. Uh, for a long a period of time, there is this sense in El Salvador that all the investigation from the, your office are weak. Uh, what is your office doing to change this feeling in El Salvador? And the second, uh, the second question is, uh, what's the difference between your work and the other attorneys to, uh, 
build cases against corruption? Well, I don't know if if, if there is if there is a generalized perception that the that the investigations at the fiscalia are weak, because we have prosecuted and indicted a lot of people. Uh, we cannot win all the cases, but as we said, we are aware that we need to strengthen the institution. What's the difference that I'm doing uh, and my predecessors, my predecessors did? I don't. I, I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm focused on my job. I'm focused to to investigate, to be objective and to bring strong cases to the judicial system. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a, a media guy. I, I go to do my job and let the work talk for me. So I think it's, I just have nine months Investigations take a little more time, but I hope the results will speak for, the, for, their, for themselves. Well, thank you very much. I want to note the presence, I guess, here of uh, five members of the Supreme Court. Of there are four right four now. Four members of the for Supreme justices, Court. For justices, justices of the Supreme, of the Supreme Court, Court are, are, are with us. And we thank them this morning with us. for their presence. We're honored by their presence. Uh, you mentioned that... Uh, Mr. Three of them. Three of them. Three. I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Attorney General, that it's better to have honest uh, men than brilliant people. Uh, in this case, I think we've been fortunate to meet uh, someone who's both of those things, honest oh. and brilliant. Yeah, there are a lot here. <laughs> and, we th and we thank you very much. Uh, for all of you who uh, worry about this issue of transnational organized crime, uh, I think, and whether we're going to make any headway, if we do, it's going to be, be because of people uh, like the Attorney General, uh, and in particular, in El Salvador, and if we can move the needle. So this should give you all hope, and you should all be thinking of the first five things that you can do to help this man uh, do his job more effectively. We're, uh, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, me... I appreciate it, Ambassador. <laughs> thank you. We're going to take about a, a one-minute break. Please uh, stay in your places. We're going to set up for the next panel. Uh, uh, and, but uh, please um, uh, thank, you, thank again thank the you. Attorney General for his presence here.
Well, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience uh, and for your participation. If I could get your attention again, let me just say I'm delighted uh, to introduce the moderator of this uh, panel, uh, Juan Jose Dabu, an old friend uh, from El Salvador. It's because of his connections and initiative that we had the Attorney General with us uh, this morning. Uh, and uh, we've also uh, been honored that he's agreed to join the American Enterprise Institute's team on Latin America. Uh, he will be uh, leading this discussion as his, in, his initial uh, contribution to our program. Uh, he uh, is a uh, visiting fellow here. He brings a decade of experience from the private sector and world of economic development. He was a managing director of the World Bank from 2006 to 2010. He oversaw the bank's operations in Africa, the Middle East, East Asia, and Latin America. From 1999 to 2004, uh, Dr. Daoub served concurrently as El Salvador's Minister of Finance and his Chief of Staff uh, to President uh, uh, Francisco Flores. In these high-profile dual roles, Dr. Dabu helped to navigate his country through several regional economic challenges, including securing and sustaining El Salvador's investment-grade rating, dollarizing the economy, and completing a free trade agreement of the, with the United States, and all of this uh, after the end of a, of a civil war. A great accomplishment. And we consider it an accomplishment and achievement of our own to have you join our team. Uh, and thank you very much. I want you to all give him a welcome as we start this next panel. Like, please. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Noriega. I'm very happy to be part of the American Enterprise Institute uh, Latin American Studies Program, which works really to uh, not only study, analyze, and provide ideas, but take into practice in as much as possible solutions for policymakers, for the private sector, for uh, the public, both in the United States and in Latin America. I will be focusing my work on multilateral institutions and on economic development, uh, with emphasis, of course, in Latin America and in Central America. I will also be paying a lot of attention to research in areas such as adaptation and resilience. And I am a firm believer that private sector-led growth is one of the most important uh, uh, needs that we have in developing countries. Uh, in a fast evolving world, multilateral institutions need to adapt and governments need to be bolder in their public policies in order to remove obstacles for people to take destiny into their own hands. And one of the greatest obstacles that we face in many developing countries are the topics that we are discussing this morning. Transnational organized crime, corruption, insecurity more broadly, uh, really are taking us back in terms of the opportunities and the progress that some of our countries could make. So today we have with us three experts, uh, which uh, you have seen their bios, but I'll do a brief introduction. And then we're gonna do three rounds of questions and then I go to you as members of the audience to ask uh, the questions that you might wish to ask. First, let me introduce Dr. Roberto Gil Suart. He is a political advisor and legal expert with extensive experience working in the Mexican government. He's currently a founding partner at Accuracy, uh, a law firm based in Mexico City. In the past, he has served in several positions in the government of Mexico, including as Chief of Staff at the Secretary of Internal Affairs, a federal congressman, Under Secretary of Government at the Ministry of the Interior, and Chief of Staff of the former President of Mexico, Felipe Calderón. He was also President of the Senate of Mexico in the years 2015 and 2016. He studied law at uh, the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México and constitutional law at the Charles III University of Madrid. We also have with us Selina Realullo, a professor of practice at the William J. Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies at the National Defense University, where she focuses on US national security, illicit networks, transnational organized crime, counterterrorism, and threat finance issues. 
She has two decades of international experience in the public, private, uh, and academic sectors, including a former including a former U.S. diplomat. She's a graduate of the Harvard Business School, of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and of Georgetown University School of Foreign Affairs. And finally, Dr. Rian Berg is a researcher here at AEI, where he focuses on transnational organized crime, narco-trafficking, and illicit networks. He also studies Latin American foreign policy and development issues. He has a PhD and a Master of Science and a Master of Philosophy from Oxford University. So we have uh, the kind of uh, people that can help us navigate through Latin America on the issues that we're discussing this morning. We heard from Attorney General uh, Melara of El Salvador about El Salvador, and one can extrapolate a little bit of that experience to the Northern Triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. In this uh, panel, we're going to be talking about Mexico, we're going to talk about Brazil, we're going to talk, ab uh, we're going to talk about uh, things that are happening in the Caribbean as well, with the idea that we have a better sense of what is going on, of the importance of partnerships, especially with the United States, and the uh, uh, importance of the work that we are trying to do here at AI in terms of research on all of these matters. So let me start with uh, Dr. Hill. Um, you just heard the Attorney General of El Salvador talk about the challenges uh, that uh, El Salvador is facing. Uh, can you talk about uh, the current security situation in Mexico, uh, the threat that that poses for uh, your people and, and the country? And also, as you describe the current situation, if you can point at some concrete experiences during your term in government and at the Senate, <coughs> of the sort of actions and legislation that was put into practice to somehow mitigate the security challenges of Mexico. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, I want to thank uh, the American Enterprise Institute for this invitation, uh, Ambassador Noriega, thank you very much. And also, I want to thank for the opportunity of practice makes English as, as well. So. Um, we, we go to the same school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a problem. Uh, maybe, maybe you know about this. A week ago, uh, the streets of Culiacán, the capital of the state of uh, Sinaloa, turned into a warlike zone. Uh, later, later, we uh, will know it was because Mexican federal security forces were trying to capture the Chapo's son. After more than uh, four hours of clashes between the Sinaloa cartel and federal forces, including the army, the federal government took the decision to release the detainee under the argument that it was necessary to avoid a major confrontation uh, and even more collateral damages. Uh, that afternoon, my country was confronted to the fact that organized crime is still a powerful threat for the population, that they are able to terrorize an entire city, and also that more than ordinary response is required to contain these kind of organizations. Uh, here are some clues to give a true dimension to what happened in Culiacán. First, this was the first ground and top priority operation of the newly created National Guard. Uh, this, uh, the first attempt of the new government to capture a leader of one of the biggest criminal organizations, Cartel de Sinaloa. By the way, agreeing to a request of the US government. Uh, the operation failed due to bad planning and worse execution. But also, it showed that the National Guard is not well coordinated with the rest of the failed agencies. And that is a very bad sign. Uh, secondly, President Lopez Obrador has repeated since the event occurred that he did not know anything about the operation. The obvious question are then, who is commanding over 
the National Security Cabinet? And how will this cabinet be accountable if no one is assuming responsibility of, for, making, for taking decisions? Uh, in third place, this president is very delicate, in my opinion. How many more criminal organizations, no matter the scale, will be able to challenge the government in this way? In my opinion, Culiacan is in, really, is in reality a symptom, not just an, an, a very dramatic situation or, a, or an event. It's a, it's a symptom of, of course, the institutional weakness of the, is the Mexican state. But I think that also is a symptom of the type of strategy that the current government is following. And let me, let me give you, let me share a few concerns about the strategy of the new government. First, federal forces have received the direct operative order not to intervene against organized crime. Culiacán was not the first case in which federal forces retreated. There are other cases, for example, the one that we recently saw in Michoacán. So a question is how long the government will be able to restrain itself and its forces, especially if the murder rate keep rising. Secondly, it is difficult to see any rationality in the initial, initial deployment of the National Guard. The most violent states or regions are not the ones with more guards deployed in Mexico. I mean, uh, in the first phase of the National Guard deployment, there were around 56,000 guards throughout the country. When Culiacan occurred, there were less than 1,000 guards in Sinaloa, Compton of El Chapo and his group. Meanwhile, Mexico City has more than 3,000. I don't understand uh, what is the, the criteria to, the, to the, the National Guard deployment. Third, uh, after the tariff crisis, the National Guard is effectively acting as a border patrol. Not only in the northern border, but also in the southern one, which implies that only a low number of elements is being used for reducing the violence generated by organized crime, which in my opinion should be the top priority of the federal government. Fourth, the new government has cancelled without any explanation the strategy of going after the leaders of the most dangerous and violent organization. It is important to say that this program was created with the purpose of weakening the operational capacities of the organized crime. The, the, the current administration canceled that program. Again, this makes feel that the new strategy will be no more complex than manage the problem. I mean, organized crime problem. Fifth, at least in one, at least in, in what we can see in the media, there is not a single criminal case against the financial structures of organized crime. I don't see any kind of these cases being prosecuted. But at the same time, the government majority in the Congress is passing strict rules against taxpayers, which include the possibility to use national security tools or exceptional procedural treatments against tax fraud, for example. In a, in a nutshell, hard laws and heavy endorsement methods against taxpayers, but soft truths against the violent criminals. It, it is not clear uh, what kind of security cooperation we, uh, the government will follow in the future. In conclusion, it is not clear what is the new strategy about. And uh, as a personal opinion, there is no way to pacify Mexico unless the government's capacities become stronger 
than the organized crimes. During the past decade, we have repeated a sort of mantra. Public safety will be the result of more boots on the ground, less corruption, and more effective law enforcement. The problem is that our efforts have not been consistent enough during the past years. Every new administration has the temptation to break from the past and start over with new policies. And in the, in the case of the new or the current administration, this is, uh, this is uh, very clear. The new administration is insisting that everything, anything that, become, that comes from the past are corrupt, are useless, and uh, it's not important to protect and to, uh, to uh, keep uh, in enhancing these efforts. So what we saw in Culiacan uh, is, uh, it is just the, the iceberg of a mm -hmm. deepest problem. Institutional weakness, but also, in my opinion, a strategy that in, doesn't make sense, at least at this moment. Thank you, Dr. Hill. We're going to dive into a couple of issues in the next rounds, including some facts and numbers, if, if you can share some, and sure. also some of the policies that, during the term of President Calderon and your term in Congress, you put forward some initiatives uh, like Merida and others that, that, that were implemented to try to think, going forward, what would be some of the recommendations in order to change the picture that you have just described for us. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Selena, your expertise and the work that you do at the Perry Center has a lot to do with building partnerships, relationship, and cooperation so that what Dr. Hill was describing and what Dr. Melara described earlier actually becomes a reality in terms of the work between the United States and those uh, attorney general's offices or other institutions in Latin America that are asking for help and are welcoming the help because there are other parts of the world and I have worked in the Middle East, in Asia, in Africa. Not everywhere they welcome the help that countries like the United States can provide. So tell us how those uh, uh, these partnerships look like? How are they put together? And give a couple of examples of partnerships that are working and those that might not be working too well, what needs to be done in order to improve those relationships that exist between the United, the United States and some Latin American governments that you care to share with us? Sure, so at the Perry Center, we do a lot of uh, training and education for our counterparts that are not just military and um, uh, police, we're actually dealing with civil society as well as civilians. And I was really delighted to hear from the Attorney General how there's a lot of improvement in terms of the rule of law and more importantly, law enforcement and these cases against corruption and money laundering, which you know is my favorite topic. But when we take a look at international cooperation, we do bilateral in the case of the United States. And I'm about to go to Mexico and it'll be very tough conversations when we go to see and analyze as a case study the disaster that took place a week ago. And more importantly, the interpretation that it was a major win, if not an inflection point, of the Sinaloa cartel over so the surrender of what we call state forces who have, in normal circumstances, the monopoly and legitimate use of force. What we're seeing around the region, though, in terms of um, kind of what we call force multipliers, drug trafficking continues to be the most lucrative illicit activity in the world, but more importantly, it's becoming much more global. And we see also the presence of both uh, Mexican as well as Brazilian transnational organizations that are starting to dominate what we call the actual routes. And we're not just talking about cocaine, but also heroin and more disturbingly synthetics. Um, here in the United States, we average 193 overdose deaths due to opioids. And a lot of it, sadly, is coming from uh, Mexico, from Sinaloa and Guerrero, which are in the form of heroin and fentanyl. So in terms of countering um, illicit trafficking, probably one of the better examples that's um, headed by the United States 
is under Southern Command. It's the Joint Interagency Task Force South. It's been in existence over 20 years, and they have to do reports, like we all do, to Congress as well as to our um, leaders in government. But their mission is very clear. It's countering illicit trafficking. It used to be just drugs, but now they're very involved in precursors, money, and sadly, the phenomenon of um, uh, alien smuggling, human trafficking and human smuggling. Why they're actually very um, effective is that they actually have uh, over a dozen other countries, um, not, just, uh, uh, not just Latin America, but actually European partners, who have full-time liaison officers. So there's real-time um, sharing of information and intelligence and joint operations. They've been extremely effective this past year. I just came from Panama, where they had record seizures of cocaine, which is sadly the reflection of what's happening now with the explosive record production of cocaine um, in Colombia. What we're also starting to see is a lot of the traditional roots of maritime are starting to re-up. And a lot of it, we can't have a session on Latin America and transnational organized crime without speaking about the elephant in the room that Venezuela. is Venezuela. Venezuela, in my eyes, and I've written and testified to this effect, is a criminalized state. So you've actually seen um, Colombian armed groups in the form of the dissidents of the FARC, as well as the ELN, have historically seek a, uh, sought safe harbor in Venezuela, but it's almost an, op it's an open secret now that they're collaborating. So that cocaine is starting to come through Venezuela and taking traditional maritime routes um, uh, eastbound, and Dominican Republic is one of the areas that is actually being really overwhelmed by the cocaine trafficking because of the fact they also have and house a diaspora of the good and the bad from Venezuela and the presence of European um, mafias, including the Russians, who are transporting the cocaine from the Caribbean to European markets that are much more lucrative. We've also seen, sadly, I've just been in Colombia too uh, in August, the number of Mexican nationals who've been arrested in Colombia for aiding and abetting the more efficient production of cocaine is extremely troublesome. So these international agreements that we have bilaterally, so Colombia and uh, Panama have a very uh, close cooperation on both migration, but more importantly on counter-narcotics, and all the way through Central America. <coughs> and more importantly, we're looking at this as a, a much more regional effect, particularly because this cocaine is looking for markets. Just to give you a couple of facts, because I know you and I are economists, we like uh, uh, figures. A kilo of cocaine now costs, and this is the estimate of the UN, $180,000 a kilo in Australia and over 100,000 in Russia. This is why there are external actors that are not traditionally in the Latin American hemisphere that are starting to enter in. And you and I have discussed also the role of terrorist groups, not just the FARC and ELN and Shining Path in cocaine trafficking, but Lebanese Hezbollah. So that's why we've actually, uh, this past year was a banner year for those who look at this convergence of terrorism and crime between Lebanese Hezbollah and more importantly the cocaine trafficking and money laundering that's been taking place a lot in the tri-border of South America. This is where Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil meet. Um, it was historic at the um, counterterrorism conference in Argentina, where Secretary Pompeo attended, that Le Lebanese Hezbollah was designated by Argentina as an international terrorist group. Yeah, and we're gonna and talk a, a little month bit after, about that. Yeah, and a month about. after was Paraguay. So we tried to take a look at how do you create, with countries that have political will, how do you translate that political will into actual counter-narcotics and migration issues in order to attack the scourge of narco-trafficking as well as human trafficking, which is the second most lucrative crime in the world? Thank you, Selena. Let me now turn to Ryan. Uh, you are about to finish, you're about to complete an in-depth report on Brazil's PCC gang. Uh, and I like to learn more about that. Tell the audience a little bit more about what to expect. Give us a sneak preview of it. But also, uh, Ryan, if you can, as uh, you describe the work that you are doing, if you can talk a little bit to the kind of cooperation that US and Brazil is having and, or, or should be having, but also between Brazil and the uh, neighboring countries like Paraguay and, uh, and Argentina. Well, I've spent the better part of my uh, year here at AEI focusing on what I think is, a, is an under-focused upon uh, aspect of transnational organized crime, which is the role of prisons in Latin America. 
in furthering TOC and being logistical hubs for transnational organized crime, and that's what led me to focus on the PCC or the Primeiro Comando da Capital uh, in Portuguese, sometimes it's translated as the First Capital Command uh, in English. Now, this is a prison-based transnational organized crime group, and so if there's one thing that I want my report to, to do once it's released um, is to uh, have people in the audience and policymakers in the region understand that uh, when it comes to the fight against TOC in the Americas, and especially in Brazil, it only begins with the act of incarceration. And I think one thing that we've, one mistake that policymakers um, in the region have made over the past years uh, has been to assume that, that the, the fight ends with the act of incarceration, but it's, it's really just the beginning. Uh, and so this is a group that goes way back uh, to, the, to the early 90s. Um, it, there was a formation of a, of a young group called the Capitals Gang in, in Sao Paulo prisons um, after, a, after a famous riot and massacre in a, in a prison called Caranjiru. Uh, the Brazilian security uh, forces there uh, summarily executed about 111 prisoners uh, after the riot. And, and the gang used this, um, this event to, uh, to argue that, uh, that weakness and internal division uh, allowed them to be sort of preyed upon uh, and extorted by prison guards. And so the gang originally had a focus of, of maintaining human rights within, a prison, within the prison system, uh, protecting against uh, extortion and, and predation. It very quickly expanded into, into, into something else uh, after that. And, and much of Brazil's urban violence Brazil is the most homicidal country on earth. 64,000 homicides in 2017, the year that I was living in, in, uh, in Brazil. Much of it is driven by groups like the PCC. So they're based within prisons, but they operate uh, outside of prisons. Their power projection capabilities is, are, are well outside of, of, of the prison walls. So 64,000 homicides in 2017. Between 1980 and 2010, more than a million homicides, to put this in sort of a frightening context that's, that's more than the death toll of the 12 bloodiest armed conflicts in the world during the same period of time. Um, this is a gang that, um, like I said, has the ability to project influence beyond the prison walls and actually engages in criminal governance um, in communities where there are very little uh, state presence. So it's shaping norms, it's shaping governance, it's actually delivering public goods and services as a way of uh, securing the loyalty of the people that it rules over in peripheral communities in Sao Paulo and in other areas around Brazil. Uh, today, I would say that the PCC could be characterized by about five different types of characteristics. The first is that ability to project power outside of the prison walls through an external support network. There's something that, uh, um, that I've deemed uh, prison insurance. Uh, it's a type of of, of scheme that this group runs, which basically uh, allows them to ensure the loyalty of external actors. That is to say, if, if, the, if the, the carceral policies of the country in which you're operating pretty much guarantee that at some point in time you're going to have, uh, or you're going to have to spend some time within the, uh, the prison system of that country, loyalty is a very important thing uh, to be able to demonstrate um, on the outside in terms of it making a, a big difference to your treatment. Um, on the inside, and so uh, loyal actors on the outside by themselves, uh, sort of what I call prison insurance um, from the PCC w once they're on the inside. These groups provide local order in peripheral communities. They credibly threaten um, and, uh, and, and actually perform synchronized attacks, mass disruption with little to no warning in 2001, and in 2006 there was mass disruption um, of the city of Sao Paulo, uh, the largest metropolitan area in the Americas, particularly in the 2006 attack. Uh, the city was, was brought to his knees. It was shut down, paralyzed by fear because of, uh, of over 500 synchronized attacks, both within and without prisons. Um, the fourth characteristic is that they don't just traffic drugs. They engage in more complex operations like uh, highway thefts, like bank heists, like transnational organized operations in, in Bolivia and in, and in Paraguay. Um, one of the best examples was 2017 heist uh, in Paraguay, which included uh, high-powered machine guns, weaponry that, uh, that, that you would normally only see on the battlefield possessed by the U.S. military, uh, high-powered speedboats as, as getaway mechanisms. Uh, and the last bit, uh, or the last characteristic, I would say, is that they have a complete monopoly um, on, the, on, the, on the use of violence in terms of criminal groups within, uh, within Brazil. And so um, there's actually been some research done on the ability of the PCC to drive homicide rates with its activities. Um, 
And so according to the, to the Brazilian Federal Police, um, the PCC has vanquished many of its domestic uh, rivals. Um, it's dominant within Brazil. It's expanding to uh, pretty much every country in South America. It's expanded as far north as, uh, as making contacts in, uh, in Honduras with like-minded groups and, and other prison-based organizations like the MS-13. Uh, and so this is a group that I think is understudied but needs to be focused on because it is a group that's on the march. Uh, it is a group that has significant capabilities and, and it's a group that I think the Brazilian state, and now I'm getting to the cooperation aspect, the Brazilian state has under has under focused on as well. Uh, for a long time, the Brazilian state was engaged in a fight against transnational organized crime by denial. In fact, when it comes to the, the, the PCC as a group, the Brazilian state denied its existence until the early 2000s when it became um, uh, basically irrefutable after the 2001 synchronized attacks in Sao Paulo that this group existed. But previous to that, you had governors, you had presidents, you had a number of political figures saying that this was a fiction uh, of imagination. So for 10 years, the Brazilian state was, was behind the, uh, the fight against, against the PCC. In terms of the number of things that the, the US is doing with Brazil, I think you need to look at US-Brazil cooperation uh, in, the, in the wider lens of, of the US-Brazil relationship, which has been to this date since the, the redemocratization of Brazil in the mid-1980s, um, lacking a little bit. I think, I think policymakers feel uh, as though on both sides of, 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 of this relationship that this could be so much more, but it never actually attains um, uh, that level. And so we have a number of high-level defense uh, cooperation dialogues, we've got general security discussions, we've got a new, a new vehicle that the State Department just created uh, last year, a, a high-level security dialogue, which, which hasn't really been utilized, in my opinion, to the full extent that it possibly can. Uh, and so there are a number of things that I think that, uh, uh, that, that we can do, which we haven't yet done, and, uh, and the hope is that with, uh, with these two current administrations, we finally have some sort of alignment where, uh, where we can make great progress on these transnational issues. Well, we look forward to reading the report and getting a little bit more information uh, 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 when you publish it. Let me go back to, to Dr. Hill. Uh, you describe very eloquently the current situation of, uh, of Mexico from the security perspective, which you, at the end, basically summarize it as uh, an increasing danger that is finding some kind of weak institutional capacity. Uh, and some ill distribution of the current resources to areas of the country with more or less need <coughs> of those resources. You uh, led an effort uh, with the then President Felipe Calderon and the United States on uh, a coordinated effort to, to combat crime, not only for the good of Mexico, but because of what Selena, for example, was mentioning, and we have seen in other countries, the effect that that has in the United States. So tell us about uh, some of the initiatives that were led at the time you had the opportunity of implementing uh, solutions. Tell us a little bit about the Merida plan, what worked, what didn't, what could work. And uh, because time is going to be of the essence here, let me ask also, uh, going forward, uh, if you were to give recommendations uh, to the current administration in your country, uh, what would be those recommendations? So tell us a little bit about previous efforts and how they worked, and tell us about what would be your recommendation to the current administration to enhance or improve the uh, fight against the kind of crimes that you described. Thank you. Yes, the, in, during the um, Felipe Calderon administration, uh, there was a very strong and close relationship with the United States. Um, in order to have better information, uh, operative information, better intelligence, but also uh, for uh, develop uh, ca institutional capacities. That's why uh, Initiative uh, Merida uh, w is very important for our country. A lot of money come, uh, came from the United States to, uh, in order to build institutions, as for example the federal police. Uh, when when the President Calderon took office, we, we have we have we had uh, sixty thousand uh, federal police officers, six thousand police officers for a country uh, uh, with one one hundred twenty million people. So that's 
I, I think that this is a good picture of what, 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 what happened in, in my country in 2006. Uh, when when the, the, the president uh, left the office, uh, the federal police uh, was around 38,000 uh, uh, police officers. So that what, that, uh, poli the federal police was a very, uh, uh, a very uh, an, an effort, an important effort during the, 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 the administration. And, and also, uh, we changed the constitution to, uh, to introduce a new uh, uh, crime uh, yep. system. Yeah, uh, uh, we introduced the oral, uh, the oral trials, and uh, uh, that was a very, a very uh, big reform. And also, we changed the constitution to uh, 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 protect uh, uh, with more effectiveness the human rights. I think. Uh, the, the, the investment in the, uh, during that administration uh, was focused on built institutions. So uh, I think that uh, there's two areas uh, where the security uh, cooperation could be more effective between the uh, uh, United States and Mexico. One is firearms, gun control, and the other one is uh, local, local uh, institutional development. I will start with firearms. Uh, according to uh, official estimates, more than 200,000 weapons enter every year from the US. 200,000 weapons every day, every, every year. Uh, since 2004, when the US government dropped the Federal Assault, assault Weapons Ban, the number of this kind of weapons has increased. Look carefully at this, at this fact. Between 2011 and 2016, more than 100,000 weapons were confiscated across the country. 70% were legally by in the US. 75% of the weapons confiscated between 2009 and 2014 in Mexico were legally valid in three border states, Texas, California, and Arizona. How do, how do we know that? Because since 2010, during the, the Felipe Calderon administration, US and Mexico have been sharing information through the E-Trace database. E-Trace is a powerful tool to track the illegal flow of weapons. Very powerful. The problem is that e -trace, the E-Trace agreement has a limitation. It can only use uh, case by case, just for the purposes of criminal uh, prosecution, not for designing or implementing policies to prevent or deter illegal flows of weapons. So one thing that could be done is to review this agreement in order to give more flexibility to the access to E-Trace. Uh, I'm convinced that the, Mexico should, the Mexican government should not, be, should not put any more efforts trying to convince the American government to change the guns laws in the US. I'm totally convinced of that. Uh, we have to assume that there are too many political and social issues around gun control, so the political approach uh, should be less ambitious. Uh, we must actually insist on a more effect effective enforcement of the current law, especially in the border states. Background checks, waiting periods, buyer registrations, know your customers' practices, a specific measure for the prevention of strawman buyers, more attention on gun shows, surveillance over e-commerce of firearms, firearms, more controls on gun spar trading and over domestic fabrication of weapons. With this, we can do a lot in terms of reducing the flows of illegal weapons to Mexico. Because as you know, there are, uh, there are a strong relation between uh, availability of weapons and violence. So I think this could be 
a, a big step in reducing the, the supply. Uh, the other thing, the, the other area is local uh, institutional development. Uh, the, the patterns of, the behavioral patterns, patterns of organized crime is changing. The, the, the business model too. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me say something about the income of the, the, organized, the, organized, or the organized crime. Uh, drug trafficking is not the main source of income of, of organized crime anymore. Human trafficking, kidnapping, oil theft are becoming more profitable activities. That than selling drugs, especially since the, the price of cocaine or marijuana uh, start to drop. Actually, the, the new leaders of the organizations uh, don't really know how the international drug trafficking market work. They don't, they don't have the, the, the WhatsApp of the guy who, who in, in, in Colombia who, who produced the, the, the cocaine. Uh, let, let me give you a, a fact. During the, during the 90s, there was three or four big organizations focused on drug trafficking. So that's why it, it was easy to handle the problem. Right now, official reports reveal more than 250 active organized crime cells in Mexico. We pass, for, we pass from four big organizations to more than 200, 250 uh, micro-organizations. These micro-organizations are not in the drug trafficking <laughs> business. They are doing a lot of things different, like human trafficking, as, as, as I said. So the, these micro-organizations are not just uh, pulverized and doing business through many different criminal activities. They need to use violence to resist the government pressure, but also to compete with other similar organizations. I mean, it means that there's a lot of competitors across the board of any illicit, illegal markets. That's the problem of the violence in Mexico, one of the, big, one of the most important problems in Mexico. So, I, I, I strongly believe that the efforts of international cooperation, as many the initiative, should be focal, focused on local needs because I think that organized crime is increasingly becoming more a local problem than a federal one. So a good idea of, a good idea of cooperation could be find a way to support local institutional development programs. Which is, not, which is not easy given the diplomatic formalities because the communication is between uh, federal governments, not between local governments and the uh, cooperation agencies. So if the current administration has not a strong commitment against organized crime, we have to find the way to support those governments that has this commitment. And I think that's a, that's a very valuable observation, especially for very large countries like Mexico, uh, Brazil, that we have been talking about, where there is a significant difference in terms of capacities between the national or federal government and the local governments in terms of resources. When I was at the, at the World Bank, there was always this discussion about how best to support if the national government, who is the authority with whom the bank works, for example, do not request resources for the local level. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also mentioned the fact that crime organizations, criminal organizations are diversifying their portfolio and no longer only doing drug business in drug trafficking, but in human trafficking and others. So, and you also put forward a couple of ideas in terms of if you were to uh, further strengthen the relationship with the United States, what sort of things would you ask for and you talk about the border states, et cetera. So let me ask Selena, if you were in a position, Selena, uh, of being the US government that 
grants or provides the support and the cooperation that uh, Dr. Hill was mentioning, what would you ask in return? What would the U.S. ask in return for such cooperation and support to Mexico in this particular scenario? Uh, and then I'll go to the final question to Ryan, so Selena. So throughout the Latin America, there's several bilateral and then more importantly regional arrangements of foreign assistance. And I've been working 10 years, and I think we've actually worked on several projects together since the birth of Merida, which was actually um, kind of tried to be a copy of Plan Colombia. Mm -hmm. So when we were doing metrics, which is always the question, that's great, uh, political will, but what are the results on the ground? So some of the things that we're always looking at is how many operations have actually dismantled laboratories, interdicted X number of kilos of cocaine, heroin, uh, synthetic drugs. But I think the better, and then more importantly, as we've seen from the, uh, the speech by the Attorney General, it really comes down to how many cases have been prosecuted, and more importantly, how many people have been thrown in jail. Because sometimes the problem is that you have the laws in place, the legal framework, and a wonderful, um, I guess, political will by the people who are investigating and the prosecutors, but due to corruption, you never quite get to the actual sanction against the person or the company or the group. And that's where we see a little bit of problems in terms of bringing it all the way to the end. So I actually take a look at this whole problem in the Americas as really being fed by two factors corruption and impunity. And we've seen this in the case of Mexico, in Colombia and Central America. And until we bring those people to justice and make it not just away politicians, and I think the revelation of the Panama Papers, and there's a movie now on Netflix I was told that came out last week, showed that average citizens in Latin America have been working hard, paying their taxes, respecting the law, but from sports figures to politicians to more importantly um, actual business leaders have been operating in a totally separate system. And it always comes back to what we've found is following the money, and you know I've been following this for many years, has been the most effective. Because as we know in cases in Colombia and in Mexico, sometimes the informant or the witness doesn't quite make it to the courts or changes his or her story. But when we follow communications, as well as financial intelligence, those are the best ways to link, and then more importantly, bring these cases to bear. I would agree with you, I'm very disappointed that there's tremendous capability in Mexico to go after money laundering, um, whether it's a crime against the state of corruption, political corruption, but more importantly, since we know that these cartels, they don't have political objectives, it's all about the money. Whether we talk about PCC, the different cartelitos all across, or the FARC and the ELN who claim to be political actors, it's all literally about the money. And there's something else that we're seeing which is very troublesome, and going back a little bit to Venezuela, the dollarization of transnational organized crime makes places like El Salvador, Ecuador, and actually everything's transacted in Venezuela with dollars. So until we can get the rest of the region to actually really clamp down on money laundering and more importantly the flow of dollars, and then we hope with the Lima Group and the latest vote in the OAS, with the TR to reinforce the implementation of sanctions against the Maduro regime that you'll actually be able to suffocate them from being in power. Because they're actually living not off of legitimate economy, they're actually living off oil, drugs, gold, trafficking, and unfortunately it's all done in US dollars. So we're seeing this as a major different way, because the dollar is king in many other markets, but sadly, particularly for the capos around the region. Thank you, Selena. Let me give the last two minutes to Ryan. Uh, Brazil has been ground zero for the fight against corruption. But what we just heard about in terms of institutions that are not as strong as they should be, how does the fight against corruption, uh, uh, or rather, how does corruption undermine some of the efforts that are taking place in Brazil to combat transnational organized crime organizations? Well, I think Brazil has been one of the shining stars in the region in terms of uh, cleaning up its own domestic situation. The Lava Jato, the so-called Lava Jato uh, investigation has been wide ranging. It's been impressive. It's been done uh, domestically with, with, uh, with the legal tools that, that Brazil has with very little 
uh, sort of outside uh, outside uh, cooperation. Uh, but but the, um, the 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 level of, of corruption uh, that's been um, unearthed by this by this investigation, which has re resulted in, in, in over 200 convictions, um, threatens to sort of sap energy from uh, from bilateral cooperation agreements, from the goodwill uh, to fight transnational organized crime. I'm just looking into the, thinking about the Brazilian domestic situation. Uh, there are particular parties within uh, the Brazilian system that have no desire whatsoever uh, to cooperate with the United States when it comes to uh, fighting transnational organized crime uh, because they're quite focused on um, uh, sort of gaining the release of political figures who have put in who have been put in prison by the Love Jato uh, investigation. There's obviously growing concern over the over the current administration and any sort of involvement that uh, that one of the president's sons might have had in transnational organized crime. And so corruption obviously uh, uh, um, you know saps the, the energy and the good and the goodwill of these of these initiatives. Um, it also, I think, reduces the effect or the power of these asymmetrical tools that the United States is using to fight transnational organized crime, like sanctions, from having their full effect. Um, I think it permits groups like the PCC and its Rio-based rival, the Comando Vermelho, the Red Command, uh, to maintain their operations in prisons, uh, going back to my, to my earlier answer. Uh, it allows them to, uh, to smuggle contraband, to co-opt police forces, to use prisons as logistical hubs for significant transnational organized crime uh, in, in the Southern Hemisphere. But I also think corruption has the ability to sort of ignite uh, our imagination as to what we can do further. Uh, I think that, uh, as Selena mentioned, um, the, uh, the designation of Hezbollah by President Macri uh, in Argentina on the 25th anniversary of the, of the AMIA bombings, Paraguay's quick, uh, um, uh, Paraguay following quickly thereafter, this is a big deal because it's ignited uh, a number of conversations within the, so the so-called Egmont group of financial intelligence units in the Southern Hemisphere. It's given them new reason to meet, to talk about activities. Brazil has said that it will do the same uh, by the end of the year. Hopefully they follow through um, on that. Uh, and there's also a three plus one group that was established, I think, in 2002 between Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina to discuss the TBA, the tri-border area, uh, where the PCC and other Brazilian groups are active. Um, and uh, the, the plus one is actually the U.S. We're not used to really being the plus one in many relationships, <laughs> but in this one, uh, in this one we actually are. And so I think you know corruption um, uh, gives us the you know the impetus to to actually use these vehicles that we've established uh, to engage in greater bilateral cooperation. Well, we have a few minutes left. I'd like to open the floor for the audience. Uh, when the microphone is given to you, please introduce yourself and ask a question. If you have a specific member of the panel that you want to ask the question, please do so. If not, I will select who might answer the question. Questions from the audience? Yes, please, here. Hi, my name is David Gavard. I'm from the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, my question is for Selena, actually. And I'm curious if you think that the US anti-drug efforts especially in regards to cocaine, are targeting the right parts of the supply chain in order to actually see a substantial decrease in the amount of drugs that are crossing the border. I remember reading a book by Tom Wainwright from The Economist a couple years ago who said, you know, targeting coca production um, with the large amount of money, political capital and whatnot, is like increasing the price of paint to drive up the price of luxury art. You're just looking at the wrong part of the supply chain. So I'm curious what your thoughts on that are. Let's take a couple of questions so that uh, we can, yes, lady there. Thank you. Hi, uh, still Anastasia from Johns Hopkins Ice. Uh, so I guess within the context of this presentation, <clears throat> there seems to be a disconnect between what the objective is, right? Because we hear from Selena that there needs to be more incarceration, but then we hear from Ryan that incarceration is where the process starts. So I kind of was wondering if maybe all of the panels could, everyone on the panel could briefly address what they see as the main objective of our efforts against transnational crime and what, again, they see as the, the priority for resources. So for instance, Dr. Hill said, that it's institution building and gun control enforcement. But I, I'm curious what the other members of the panel see as the priority for resources to reach that objective. Okay, Thank do you. we have any other question? Yes, the gentleman next to Anastasia. My name is Ryan Keating from the Perry Center. Um, you said, this is to Salida, 
you mentioned that TCOs are purely, have purely economic objectives and do not have political objectives. And you also alluded to growing cooperation between TCOs and terrorist groups, which have inherently political objectives. Do you think this will shape interactions with states going forward? And the final question, I think the gentleman here wanted to ask a question, you? Yes. My name is Joseph Fatmoa, and uh, I work with the Kenyan American National Foundation. My question is, uh, how these things uh, are kind of in the connected? You, don't, you have to use the judiciary, sometimes you have to work with the uh, legislatures, and uh, the executive. What happens mm -hmm. uh, when three branches of government uh, work together to suppress uh, uh, corruption? What's yeah. the best approach? Okay, so uh, Selena, there is a specific question uh, that was asked sure. to you, and if you care to address either Anastasia's or Brian's uh, question, and then I'll let the panel each take a minute to address uh, the questions that were posed to us, so Selena. So for many years, for the beginning of the drug war, is older than you actually, uh, under Nixon, we didn't really look at it as a business enterprise, right? So we actually then started and it evolved in terms of policy, taking a look at sourcing, and then trans, uh, production, which are the laboratories, then transit and interdiction, and then the user. So over the years, it's evolved to be both addressing reduction of demand as well as supply, but we've morphed in terms of taking a look at this. And there's something I'm just finishing up now is the evolution of the drug trade. There's actually more synthetics that are coming because why would you, as a, as a business leader, have to manage campesinos in Guerrero in Mexico or in the different highlands of Colombia where you're dealing with drought, climate change, you know, protests by the farmers, when you can just go to the lab and concoct whatever the flavor is. And this is very disturbing because it's actually disrupting what we call the classic kind of game of how the business works. So what we're seeing though too is that it also adapts and they're very good at this and the Mexicans are particularly good at this. They adapt to the changes in consumption. And to go to your point about how do the different um, arms of government, are they actually reacting? I think sadly the opioid epidemic here in the United States has been a rude awakening. So you actually see many congressmen on the Hill, irrespective of party, who are very committed on dealing with the prevention, treatment, and the interdiction piece. And we're seeing a much bigger approach, buzzed by the administration, and then more importantly at state and local, which is an important piece. Because a lot of the information to understand, particularly the drug trade, but other things, like human trafficking and human smuggling and the migration crisis we're living with, a lot of that data comes from the local, um, and if you don't have trustworthy local authorities, how can you build a strategy to look at that? So that's kind of what, I believe it's time for you guys to chime in. Ryan? I'll address the, uh, the incarceration question from, uh, from Anastasia. Anastasia. I, if there's one thing that I want you to get from the report, it's that prisons play a role in the, or they're an important node in the, in the transnational organized crime landscape. There's one thing I don't want you to misread into the report, it's that I'm not in favor of incarceration, uh, right? So I think that there still needs to be incarceration of important cartel figures. Uh, what I'm trying to draw attention to is the fact that uh, a domestic political reform, in this case, uh, prison reform uh, for Brazil could go a long way to actually uh, having impact on transnational organized crime activity. We need to reduce the level of codependence of the Brazilian state um, on groups like the PCC for some semblance of control within prisons. And I think that overcrowding is something that this Brazilian administration wants to address. The U.S. should help uh, in whatever capacities it's able to and, it, and, it's, and it's welcome to, uh, to help. And the most recent reports from the Justice Ministry in Brazil show that 17 people on average were in a, were in a prison cell meant for 10. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing significant overcrowding um, uh, in Brazil. Uh, Brazil has 800,000 inmates. I think it's the third largest uh, prison population in the world. There's a high use of pretrial detention. Um, so I think about 40% of, uh, of people currently in Brazilian prisons uh, are there for pretrial detention. They haven't yet been convicted. They haven't yet even received their trial. Uh, and so I know that the state is working on creative solutions for um, both ensuring citizen security, but at the same time being able to prevent some of the overcrowding issue owing to pretrial detention. Um, we need to prevent smuggling of contraband. 
uh, in Brazilian prisons. There's no reason why Brazilian prisons should be the logistical hub of transnational organized crime operations that have connections with European mafia groups, that have connections with Hezbollah, that operate in pretty much every country in the southern hemisphere. I mean, this group is so sophisticated that it created a switchboard with street-level operators that were connecting high-level but yet dispersed uh, cartel leaders to be able to have conversations about sophisticated operations even though they might be thousands of miles apart in various parts of the country. Brazil only has about five or six maximum security prisons. So one of the recommendations of the report is actually Brazil needs to build more prisons and specific it needs to build more maximum security prisons where it can actually isolate leaders who are critical to the command structure of this particular group. So let's not get it confused. I think that you know, incarceration uh, certainly uh, still needs to be the name of the game, but we need to be mindful of the fact that the fight against TOC doesn't end with incarceration. It really just begins there. And then we've got to focus on all the other stuff that comes after that. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hill. Part of the question was how to prioritize resources. Is it uh, prevention, correction, repression? Is it all of the above? Uh, maybe you want to address it as part of your final comments. I think prevention is the, is the, the best way to deter any kind of uh, uh, illegal activities. Uh, incarceration is not a solution. And, uh, at least in my opinion, it's just a, a need. No, you have to inhabilate uh, some people that are committing crimes, but as a policy, incarcer massive incarceration is not a good idea. So uh, I, I would like to conclude, uh, I have 30 seconds, in insisting <laughs> that uh, the, the challenge uh, for a country as Mexico uh, uh, is that the authorities uh, always has to be stronger than anyone who, who, who breaks the law. Uh, as we see in, in, in as we saw in, in Culiacán, there's not happening right now in Mexico. The, unfortunately, uh, the, the Mexican state has not the monopoly of the force. And uh, the name of the, I, I think, the only way to uh, uh, achieve the objective to have the monopoly of the force is building institutions. And in my opinion, the, co the cooperation between U.S. and Mexico must be focused on institutions. It's not just intelligence. It's not just money flowing to Mexico. It's the, in terms of, of uh, cooperation investment. It has to be the, the, the metric of the cooperation must to be institutions, solid institutional, criminal justice system, uh, anti-corruption uh, institutions. This is the name of the game, in, in my opinion. So, uh, I, I think in the, in the, we will see a lot of uncertainties with this new administration because we don't know how they're going to uh, face the, the organized crime problem. But I, I think that uh, the United States government and society and think tanks and any, any, any who can provide an argument to this is the uh, mayor, the principal objective of the future of Mexico is creating institutions, is build a strong state that applies the law. I think that's a very good way of finishing the panel. I think uh, strengthening institutions to provide security to the citizens, which is the main objective of any government. And allowing for job creation, therefore, uh, the need of removing obstacles for people to, to innovate, to create. I uh, want to thank Ambassador Roger Noriega for doing this event every year, for the work that is put together, the research, uh, and for AEI for hosting it. I want to also thank uh, Attorney General of El Salvador, Raul Melara, the members of the Supreme Court of El Salvador that also join us, and our members of the panel, Selena, Ryan, and Dr. Hill for uh, having come today. And we look forward to keeping in touch with all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you.